Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, or if you're new here, welcome officially to the channel. Today I want to cover a console that honestly I've sort of neglected on the channel. It was the first major console by Sega, the Master System, which ironically I'm covering last. However, we'll get into the first major console in a bit, but before we even dive into the console itself, I want to go back a bit further into Sega's history because, well, frankly it heavily influences not only the Master System, but their design philosophy throughout all their consoles pretty much, and inevitably lead them to being left behind in my personal opinion. So if you have some time, kick up your feet and relax as I explain the origins of Sega and how they influenced the Master System and more because this is the story of the Master System and beyond. The year is 1940 and Sega at this time is known as Standard Games, a coin operated company out of Hawaii. That's right, Sega actually started as an American company. Its primary purpose was to provide games for military bases. These would include simple things like jukeboxes and small gambling machines. They would eventually move to Japan and continue setting things up there for servicemen, renaming themselves Service Games of Japan. In fact, the name Sega is an abbreviation of Service Games. Eventually, the original company would come under some scrutiny, mostly for bribery and tax evasion, and got banned from U.S. air bases in both Japan and in the Philippines. This would eventually lead to them being dissolved by 1960. However, two other companies would come together to begin doing business as Sega Incorporated, Nihon Goraku Busan and Nihon Kekai Sizo, making Sega officially a Japanese-owned and operated company. And yes, I'm aware I totally butchered those names. They would eventually merge with another company, by the name of Rosen Enterprises, becoming Sega Enterprises, which is a merger of the two names, Sega from Sega Incorporated and Enterprises from Rosen Enterprises. This happened around the time of them stopping to focus on slot machines due to the new legislation, which basically made them illegal. Sega took a new tack though, and began focusing on coin-operated amusement machines. You may know them as electromechanical games, jukeboxes, pinball machines, and light gun games would all fall under this classification. They were mostly importing these devices at the time, but they were secondhand and broke often, and so they decided to start making themselves as they needed a steady, reliable supply of machines to put into the gun corners that they were putting into bowling alleys, which was a booming business at the time. Eventually, this would morph along with the industry into video games, as they dove in one of their first games, Polytron. Sega started heavily getting into the arcade scene, coming out with more and more games, even opening their own game centers. This business started to decline in the early 80s, and they began looking for new ways to keep the company afloat. So they asked their CEO, Hayao Nakayama, for advice, and his suggestion was to start leveraging all the hardware expertise they gained from the arcade market and invest into the home console market, which was still very much in its infancy. They worked up a console and called it the SG-1000, the SG standing for Sega Game. Expecting to sell around 50,000 units, they launched in 1983, exceeding their numbers by three times that, coming in at 160,000 units. Helped in part by having more regular releases than the Famicom, and in part because Famicom had a recall due to faulty circuits around this time. This generated over $2 million in revenue for the company and solidified their interest in the home market from then on. Roughly a year after this, they reworked the hardware and called it the SG-1000 Mark II. This had several hardware improvements, including detachable controllers. A first for the company, and actually in Japan, as the Famicom's controllers were also hardwired. Another modification made was a change to the cartridge type. You see, Hideki Sato disliked the cartridge shape. In his words, he thought it looked too much like a little black tombstone. So he came up with the idea of making them more card based. Thus the My Sega card was born, which at least to me looks a lot like the U cards that the Turbo Graphics would use a few years down the road. However, around this time Sega started to get into a bit of a bind. Their arcade titles didn't have the same appeal of Nintendo's more mascot like characters and weren't as well known. On top of this, Nintendo's hardware at the time was more advanced allowing for smoother scrolling and brighter sprites. Additionally, Nintendo was starting to heavily court third-party developers, 
which quickly started to make their offerings outshine the competition. Sega themselves was less inclined to try to garner relationships with these companies as they saw them as more direct competition in the arcade space than Nintendo did. And Nintendo at the time was less heavily invested in the arcade business than Sega was, so they had no problem with this. This would lead to yet another revision in hardware, the third in three years, the SG-1000 Mark III, or as we know it in the States, the Master System. The Master System, as I'm going to call it from now on, was released in 1985 in Japan, having better hardware specs than its competition, the Famicom, which one would hope given this was its third iteration, but lacking in third-party support. This was due in large part to Nintendo. You see, when Nintendo was making deals with developers, they worked into the contract that those games would not come out on any other consoles. Essentially, almost everything on a Nintendo console was an exclusive. Sega tried to compensate for this by developing their own games and porting their more popular arcade titles over to the system. But even though the new chipset was based off the Sega System 2 arcade system, it wasn't quite powerful enough to do the arcade titles as well as they were done in the arcade. They were also struggling to get ports of games to sell well. Sega wasn't done yet though. Even though they weren't doing well in Japan, they wanted to launch the console in the United States, hoping this would bolster sales enough to make the system work. They approached Bruce Lowry, who was the VP of sales at the time, to head up their North American division. He named the extension Sega of America, as he had worked for Nintendo of America and liked the combination of those words. With the new branch established, they began working on localizing the Sega Mark III for the United States market. Ironically, the name Sega Master System came from the American employees throwing darts at a dartboard with a number of different names on it. Master System won out and was further reinforced by the fact they had plans to release a second system called the Base System as well. They also, like many systems at the time, redesigned the physical design to appeal to a more Western audience giving it a more angled science fiction design. They also changed the packaging to white with a grid on it to separate it from Nintendo's black box design. The grid was an homage to how Apple was packaging their products at that time. They mimicked some of Nintendo's offerings as well by releasing what they called a power-based console. This came with a light gun, two controllers, and a pack-in multi-cart that had two titles, Hang On and Safari Hunt. This was priced at $200 and hit the United States in 1986. It was a competitive package, but Sega was hampered by several things. The first being that Nintendo released a year earlier in the States and was quickly becoming a household name due to its marketing and clever packaging. Nintendo had also again limited how much of the Master System's library could happen by their licensing packages, leaving Sega with only two third-party American publishers, Activision and Parker Brothers. Sega was struggling to sell the system in the States and decided to sell the distribution rights for the system there to Tonka, who had pretty much no experience with electronic systems. The hope was that they could leverage their knowledge of the American market in the toy division in an attempt to follow Nintendo's more successful footsteps of marketing their system as a toy rather than a video game console. However, with Tonka putting $30 million in advertising investment, the console lagged significantly behind the NES again, in part due to lack of presence, effective marketing penetration, and Nintendo having most third-party developers on lockdown. It did beat out all other competitors in the market, further solidifying the Japanese console makers as the dominant force in the console space, however. Sega wasn't through, though. They had two more markets they were pushing into, one of which being Europe, who had not really fallen into the console craze. You see, Europe was primarily dominated by computers, like the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64. Interest only really picked up when the Nintendo Entertainment System launched there in 1986. However, they weren't as well known as Sega, who had made a strong name for itself in the arcade scene in Europe. This helped give them a boost. This, along with Nintendo of Europe floundering, allowed them to sell over 6 million units by 1993 substantially outpacing the NES in that market. Neither would displace the PC as the dominant medium, but it was the first for Sega to win in a given market. This wouldn't be the only time that they beat Nintendo. They would also win in Brazil due to a few factors. First off, they moved into this market far earlier than Nintendo. Working with Tech Toy, a local toy manufacturer, this helped in a few ways. 
Tech Toy already knew the market much like Tonka did in the United States. They also manufactured them locally, making the cost of the system lower than it would have been had they imported it, mostly due to Brazil's heavy import tax. By the time Nintendo's console landed in the country, piracy of the console was rampant, and they could never really make much of a dent. In fact, the Master System was so popular, it continued to sell around 150,000 units a year all the way up till 2015 or later. This made it Brazil's most popular console ever, even topping the Odyssey 2, which was Brazil's first big console love affair. Regardless of coming in behind the Nintendo Entertainment System by a large margin overall, the two major markets proved profitable for Sega, and would lead them to push forward and rethink their approach on their next system, the Genesis or the Mega Drive if you prefer. That, however, is a story for another day, one of which I've already told, in fact. I do believe there should be a link to that video along with other Sega consoles that I've covered in the past as well, coming up shortly. Looking back on this system, it makes me see how much of Sega's entire history was dominated by trying to lead the way in the arcade or hanging on to the arcade experience for far too long costing them leads and leading to poor design decisions of markets that they refused to see the decline of. This coupled with some of their more confusing business decisions in the future would lead them to a future of bailing on hardware manufacture and focusing primarily on software in the end. However, what do you guys think of the Master System? Did any of you ever own one and how much did you use it? What are some of your favorite games? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. If I could ask you for one last favor, please leave this video a like. And if you haven't, consider subscribing. That really does help me out. For now though, thank you so much, and until next time, happy gaming.